All right. So Gretchen Carlson is here. Um, we met years ago. You were moderating an event, and I think I spoke. Was that it? Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. It was actually on Zoom because I think it was during COVID. That was probably one of my first and really only Zoom appearances. What? Yeah. Why? I, first of all, it would be hard for me to even get myself on a Zoom now, meaning physically do it. I'm, I'm one of those people that's like a dinosaur in that way, in that tech way. But I didn't see the future and understand how Zoom could be real. And it was so great to do appearances. And in your pajamas. Yeah, exactly. So that was good for me. But um, what was that for? Do you remember? I was trying to remember when my PR person was just asking me what it was. It was for some like conference that featured people who were philanthropic. Oh, okay. So we, it was about we were talking about all your efforts with when you go in after hurricanes. Be strong and, and yours and, and yours. Yeah, yeah. It was and so it, you know my efforts at lift our voices and I think it was put on by a magazine, but it's escaping me right now. Okay, what it was. So, like so many other people that I interviewed that I know, we text back and forth. We've talked about making plans. Um, we live near each other. Like so many other people. When I f look at their bio, it's something that's never come up in speaking to them or texting with them, obviously. I mean, you have the most colorful, assorted, impressive resume oh, well, and bio. I mean, if you had this as a resume <laughs> and it basically just gave your hobbies and the other things you've been involved in, it would be impressive. So I was really, really, sh <laughs> I was shocked. So some of the things I read was a talented youth violinist. Um, you were Miss Minnesota, Miss America. You went to Stanford. You were on Fox and Friends for many, many years. You also, I mean, I watched the documentary. If I, if I listen to everything I see on TV, you kind of took down a network and also started a movement. So let's start by how you are so ambitious. Even just saying that you went to Stanford alone <laughs> is something that's impressive. Yeah, look, I think there's a through line in my life about working incredibly hard, you know, but there's also a through line that I think is inspirational to especially women who maybe drop out of the workforce or are trying to look like what their next calling is after they've been a parent. And my life, I hope, is a testament to like, you can always pick up the pieces and start over if you have a really good base of working hard. Because oh. my life has worked in so many mysterious ways, just like what you rattled off. Like I was a really serious violinist as a child, and I thought that was going to be my career. And I studied at Juilliard in New York. And I burned out when I was 17. I was like, you know what? I just like too many other things in life. And to be what I wanted to be in that area, I would have had to given up everything else. And I wasn't willing to do that because I loved school and I was in drama and I liked boys. I mean, you know, there were a lot of things that were distracting me from music. And so then I went to Stanford and dedicated myself to my academics. And then my, my mom especially was pretty upset that I wasn't playing the violin anymore. So I'll never forget, she called me when I was studying overseas. She's like, I found something for you to do with your violin. And I was like, what? And she goes, Miss America. And I was like, mom, are you effing nuts? Oh. Like, I'm from Minnesota. I'm, I'm five foot three. I play classical violin, which has never won. Uh, I never watched pageants growing up. I was a tomboy. But my mom has been like this incredible driving force in my life and has really pushed me in a good way and so she won um and I you know I entered because 50 percent of your points are based on talent oh so that was that was that's what makes Miss America different from Miss USA or other Interesting. competitions I didn't know that wow most people don't unfortunately yeah so then I you know I stopped out of Stanford so that I could because once I got into it I was like okay I'm gonna give this 125 percent and there's so much luck involved in all of this but so it you know it ended up working out. I became something I never, ever dreamed that I would ever be doing. Because of Miss America? Because it was sort of being forward-facing, as we talked about before? Well, no, I just never expected to be in a pageant. Right, you know, right. I, I oh, mean, right. I, I, I play, grew up playing football with my brothers. You know, like, I, it just, I wasn't a, a, a girly girl. Like, I never watched it mm -hmm. growing up. So then suddenly I was it. I remember the night, the night that it happened, uh, to age myself, Merv Griffin and Ava Gabor... Oh because Viva Gabor was one of my judges and she was the beard for Merv Griffin. Right. Uh, oh my God. So he had hotels in Atlantic City. So they threw me this pizza party after I won up in some suite. And I remember going into the bathroom and looking at myself and being like, holy shit. Like now you did this. Now what? Right. Because you don't really prepare to like, 
be it. Like, I never thought about, oh, if this actually happens, like, what is it like to be Miss America? Oh, that's interesting because yeah. often even with any job, you're excited to get it because it's a big get. That was yeah. me with a talk show, but I didn't really want it. I don't know if that's your situation, but I thought, like, who wouldn't want this? I'm supposed to go for this. But once I had it, it wasn't really, for me, it wasn't even my personality, which I think is something people should explore new things, but you really have to think about it if it aligns with your personality, ego aside. Exactly. I mean, it's it's very similar, so... Like what it took to actually get there and win was totally different than what it was to actually be it. Well, it was very you to get there and win and be disciplined and put in the work yes. and like to win. You you are that type of person, which we're going to get into. But then you probably became a showpiece. Yeah. And like and back then I was going to drugstores and signing autographs and I'm like, what am I doing? And, and I would hear people. <laughs> this is one of the drawbacks, um, which I guess would be expected because people were always looking at your exterior. But I would actually hear people in line like I didn't have ears. And I would hear people say, that's Miss America. Oh. You know, stuff. No, look, I developed such a tough skin from it. So what I tried to do was uh, do events where I could perform my violin a lot so that people would understand that this was, you know, that it was my talent that propelled me to oh, this. Oh, that's and hard. I did a ton of speaking so that people knew I was intelligent. And actually the skills that experience gave me have helped me for the rest of my life. It, the first week I was Miss America, I was at this huge dinner with 2,000 people, and, and I thought I was just there to attend. And right before dessert, the guy in charge came up to me and whispered in my ear, I just wanted to let you know that your keynote is in five minutes. And I said, excuse me, my keynote? And, he, and I said, oh, well, well, how long would you like me to speak? And he said, oh, just 45 minutes. I went, shit. I, w I went in the bathroom with a cocktail napkin and like a pencil and wrote down some bullet points and learned from that point forward that I always had to have a speech in my back pocket but I was just a week into this. So it really gave me amazing communication skills. I'm not nervous about anything after Likewise. that. Mm -hmm. You're 22 years old and you're wow. forced to be 50. Wow. Yeah. But I think that's also something that mothers or parents can think about with their kids. Not leaning into looks being the first thing. I hear so Thank many you. times... You know, I'm not, I'm a person that is totally comfortable being with no makeup and obviously and pajamas. I post how I look like a wreck. I look like a wreck. Like <laughs> I'm not defined by what I look like at all. And it's never been what's been forward facing. And it's funny because I um, used to work with Paris and Nikki Hilton, um, worked for Kathy and do errands and be sort of their, you know, take them to school and things like that. And they were so stunningly beautiful yet always really shy and quiet because they really didn't, they were Hiltons, they were gorgeous. They really didn't have to focus on personality then. You know, Paris really blossomed. Uh, Nikki's very understated in a publicly, but I remember actually their aunt Kyle used to talk about that. Like that's not what they, they don't need to lean with their minds and personalities mm -hmm. need to lead with that. And they developed that, but as women and daughters like you want to kind of be the most interesting person in the room versus just the hottest person totally. in the room. so you you were trying to show everyone that you were more than that but also it sucks that you felt like you had to explain why you were Miss America you were kind of explaining what the whole meaning of the pageant was about you're right right like there was no category for height but people would be like oh well, why isn't she taller you know I'm like wait a minute like but to your point about parents I used to get asked by mothers during that time in my life what what should I do to prepare my daughter to possibly be Miss America? And I would be like, stop worrying about her exterior. Have her start playing an instrument or a sport or something where you learn value about yourself mm -hmm. and that you learn by putting time into something that you get better and that builds self-esteem. So my main message has always been building your self-esteem from the inside of your soul instead of how we look. And today in present day, that's that's just so much more important than when you and I were, were growing up and with social media and everything else going on now. Um, and it's one of the reasons when I was at Fox uh, that on the International Day of the Girl in October of that year, I did my show without makeup on. And I was the first person to do that on, on cable oh, news. Oh, really? Yeah. And my whole point was that we should be valued for what's coming out of our mouth and the interviews I was doing and and not how we not how we look. And Trust me, the higher ups at Fox were really mad at me that day. <laughs> well, that right, I believe you because it's also, but it also has just if you're a smart person, it has longevity. Mm -hmm. Looks don't have longevity; brains do. I mean, you, you saw Judge Judy say, like, if you can't do it at twenty, do it at thirty. Can't do it at thirty, do it at forty. And you know, she, remember, she said, "Thank God they never, I never asked for equal pay with men because 
she was making more than any of the men. I like that. And I also think that as we get older, when I think about age, I don't think about vanity. I never have, but I never think about vanity. I don't think about wrinkles. I think about being healthy for my daughter. I think about the, you know, the numbers don't lie and will I be around for her? And like, that's what makes me cry. Not looking older. Well, I'm being wise for her. Like you've had so many life experiences. I've had so many life experiences and well, I mean, I don't mean to fast forward to what I ended up doing seven years ago and oh, taking, gonna... taking down the one of the most powerful men in the world. But I have learned for my kids that those actions, as much as I feared how it would impact their lives, it actually has worked out so amazing because courage is contagious. Beyond. Oh, I, I'm going through it right now, and we're definitely going to get into that. So how did you get on to Fox and Friends? How did you become a TV personality, get in the yeah. news. So, I mean, it's a long, long journey because there's really no set path to becoming um, one of the top journalists there. And especially now with reality TV, which yes. you know a lot about people become famous overnight and suddenly they're doing TV. And I'm like, wait a minute, they don't know anything about news, but so, Oh, and also TikTok <laughs> journalists. Oh, TikTok. There are people reporting the news yeah. on TikTok with a microphone as if like, it's interesting. It's and the, some of them like, are good at it. It's yeah, research. It's yeah. interesting. No, I mean, so so look, I'm not saying that they shouldn't become yeah, popular no. at all. But when I was starting, well, actually, I was going to be a lawyer. So I took the LSATs. And then my whole Miss America experience really put me in front of the camera on a daily basis. And I had had sort of an interest in the back of my brain. And so it rekindled that interest. And then I knew my LSATs were good for five years. So if the TV thing didn't work out, I could still go to law oh. school. And it's actually one of my big regrets in my life that I've never gotten the education because I'm, I'm such a student at heart. And I always say to my husband now, do you think I have time to fit in law school? And he's like, what are you talking about? But I still might do it. But anyway, so I, I didn't go to law school and I started my first job in Richmond, Virginia. And I knew nothing about TV. I mean, it was, I had no idea what I was doing at all. And where had I, you been living prior to that? I was at, I finished my degree at Stanford after I was Miss oh, America. Oh, right after. Yeah, okay. so then I went to do this job, and three months into it, I got a female boss, which was a godsend, because she looked at me and said, you're a hard worker. You're now the political reporter. I was like, oh, crap. Like, what does that mean? She goes, you're covering the governor every day. I'm like, oh. And you didn't know anything about politics? I, I, well, I didn't know anything about politics. I didn't know anything about TV, more importantly, because <laughs> that was my job. TV is such a, like, a... a as you know, learning while you're doing, like you, it's a, it's a practical job in the sense that you can't really study how to do it. Oh no, it's practical. It, it's like being it, a chef in the kitchen. You yeah. really have to get in the kitchen to, to do in, it. Yes. Someone can tell you and you could read about it and even hear about it, but you have to do it. But I think it's harder probably to become a quote unquote knowledgeable expert on politics than it is to learn how to be on TV. True. So I was learning both at the same time. Right. It was really a sink or swim situation. Yeah. And um, you know, I worked my fool head off uh, and and built up all these contacts. And and so, it, you know, it worked out. And so then after two years in TV, what happens is you can't just like be promoted by going up to the 15th floor. You got to move cities. So you go to a bigger market. So right. then I went to Cincinnati and that's where I really learned how to do live TV and, and turn things quickly. Uh, and then I went to Cleveland and um, that was my first reporter and anchor job. Then I got promoted to the main anchor job in Cleveland Uh, Then I met my husband on a blind date, got married, and promptly got fired because I was part of the um, first primetime local newscast with two women. Okay. It was kind of a precursor to what I ended up doing, Uh but it didn't work. And the other woman was like born and bred in Cleveland, so I was the one to go. But it's a horrible experience because it's like... I was being made fun of for being fired, but it's not like I went out to a bar and like exposed myself and got fired for, for cause. Right. You know, it was just because it didn't work. So I just gotten married. It was a really dark time in my life. Um, I mean, I would sit in my garage and smoke cigarettes, um, (laughs) and cry. I've heard that story before. And cry. Cause I was just like, what am I going to, and it's hard enough to get married. It's transition. And I was established in my career. I was in my thirties and then it was just gone. And it was sort of my identity. Mm-hmm. And so I really struggled for that first year. And then I, and then as fate would have it, I got like three job offers all in Dallas in the same week. Really? Yeah. How was, soon after? A year. Oh, okay. So, because I feel that it's so funny. People want to put you down for your failures and really bring them up. And you wouldn't have your successes without your failures. No They're way. honestly valuable. Like, yep. And I have always been a person who in the moment when something, I don't get something or it fails that I have always had the wisdom to realize that it was all going to something was going to come from that difficult time so I think you don't feel it when you're living it 
But yeah, and then my mom, of course, my mom would tell me every day, it's just around the corner, <laughs> like meaning a new job. So then, like I said, as fate would have it, I got I got three job offers. Ironically, the one I took was so my boss in Cleveland, who had really nothing to do with letting me go, uh, she ended up going to work for NBC in Dallas, and that was one of the job offers. Oh, great! So it was like a testament to like I really enjoyed working with Gretchen, and I'm going to bring her back. And mm-hmm. but I did have to take a bit of a step back because I went back to like anchoring the weekend news, mm-hmm. right? So I, I had to build myself back up. And within and by the way, I lived in Dallas for a full year without my husband. We commuted. That must have been brutal. It was brutal. Yeah. And uh, but then he finally moved down there, and then nine months later, I got a job with CBS News in New York, and. And, and on my third date with him, when we first started dating, I, I, I said to him, I, this sounds like something you would say, I said, if you don't want to move to New York City in your life, don't call me back. Because ah. <laughs> that's where I'm going. Right. You know, and, and like I said, I was already in my 30s, like I was established and relationships are kind of secondary to right. me. And he said, well, that's where I want to go too. So. so I was like, okay. So we were very happy to move to New York City and that was in 2000 and we, we were like two passing ships in the night because he's a baseball agent, so he was constantly on the road recruiting and going to games. And I was an international correspondent for CBS News, so I always had a suitcase packed, and literally I would have to be on my way to the airport in two minutes after they called me to say, such and such happened, you have to go. So sometimes we'd have date night in LaGuardia. You know, it was just yeah. like, oh, I haven't seen you for a week, but you're flying to Tokyo, and I'm going to, you know, Istanbul, so I guess we'll meet up and... And it was it was really exciting time in our life. We could really enjoy New York. We didn't have kids yet. And then I got uh, then I got promoted to the Saturday early show, which was always my dream to do a morning show because mm-hmm. it was like a combination of hard news, but also showing your personality mm-hmm. and having fun. Right. And and it was also then that I could start thinking about having kids because you know morning shows are like they want to show off the babies and right. when you're an international correspondent, not so much. Oh, no one's thinking of you as a mom. And also, it sounds like you liked the structure. No, Kelly Ripa, I talked to about that. She liked when she got um, her show now, Kelly and Mark, or Kelly and Ryan, or Kelly and Regis. What it is, or yeah. Regis and Kelly, that she liked the structure. She Being an actress was not the same sort of consistency and structure. So it is a nice 100%. Gig. Yeah. So then we you know, we started trying to get pregnant. I was blessed to, I had problems at first, but I was blessed to have a, a daughter and soon after a, a son, and I just hit the jackpot, you know. Um, and then when my son was three months old, Fox came calling and they were like, how would you like to do a morning show five days a week? Well, who wouldn't say yes to that? Of course. You know, this is years ago. I now. was on that show. Oh, yeah. 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 Fox and Friends. Yeah. It was and it good. was the number one cable news show in the country. And it became more popular uh, once this, you know, our group was assembled. Um, but the hell started soon after. Right. And so the so hell was while you were on Fox. You were a fo- on Fox and Friends for how many years? Eight. That's a long... And then I had my own show at Fox for three years. But so I got fired from Fox and Friends at the height of it, at the height of the popularity because um, it was retaliation for me not acquiescing to sexual demands. Wow. And so it was made to look like I got a promotion because they gave me my own show in the afternoon, but it was actually a demotion. They slashed my pay in half. They gave me a desk from the broken closet. I mean, the, a broken desk from the closet. I had the smallest producing staff. I mean, it was like it was like a three-year journey to try and make me invisible, so that when they actually fired me, people wouldn't miss me. Oh, and that also it looked like there was a history of it. She oh, was, yeah, that I was bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't have viewers. My rating sucked. Right. You know the whole. I mean, imagine if that time and energy. And by the way, this is not only happening at Fox News. Imagine, oh, by the way, yeah. In, in, Every industry, this is happening where women and men are subjected to sexual misconduct, and then when they don't do it, they're retaliated against, right? Well, also, even not just limited to that, just sanctions and punishment for being bad. Like, you feel like a child for being bad. Mm -hmm. And I recently likened it to cult-like behavior because the person at the top, often a male figure, has the power and the charisma and is feeding off of all the, the, the... the machinations and the chessboard and the pieces that they're moving around and has individual relationships with each person that the others don't know about. And they're promising individual things they're giving, they're taking away. 
And isn't that, is that going to sound familiar? You, you and I are just talking the same language in this whole podcast um, <laughs> because that's exactly what this is all about. It's and about did you power. ever think about it in a cult manner? 100%. Okay. You said that word. Well, yes, I believe. Well, Fox has gotten just way out of hand different from even when I was there. Yeah. I would never, ever, 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 ever work at Fox News in this, you know, iteration of it. Right. But you factor that this is now, let's see, I was there 11 years. I've been gone seven. So 18 years ago, I took that job at Fox and Friends. It, I didn't even know that it was like, it's not that I'm naive. I didn't even know it was a political channel at the time. By the way, I, when I was growing up, I didn't either. I, any more than I knew that. But also when we were growing up, news was not, you didn't have anchors eye rolling about the opposite party. Like it's almost juvenile. I, when we were growing up, news was definitely more neutral. It wasn't so like, <laughs> and look what they're going to do. <laughs> like it's the well, news. You're supposed to seem somewhat impartial and it's become like almost scripted. No, it's totally like we only watch what we want to hear. So everything yes. becomes siloed and that's how we have gotten into this great divide. Right. You but can actually, hear what you want to hear by go like the way people call their friends to tell them what they want to hear or, or hate who they want them to hate. That's what, that's what, the news in general is like now to me. Some people still think I'm on Fox when I walk through the airport. Mm. And why is that? Because that's the only thing they watch. And obviously Fox News never reported on the fact that I brought down the guy who ran it. Right. right? So they, in their brains, still think they see me on Fox News, which is just crazy. So, and by the way, Roger Ailes is my alleged predator. Right. Is the one who created um, opinion TV. And so when it started... 25, 30 years ago, it was, I don't want to give him any credit, but it was a brilliant idea because it was at that time that people, the internet was starting and people were getting their news at work, right? So when they got home at night, they actually wanted to see what people thought about the news. I do not think that a place like Bravo, for example, or any of the big networks or streamers now can get away with suing someone who speaks up about improper treatment because the court of public opinion is so much more powerful than the court of the law. I just think it would be too damaging for them. Like, I think if anybody mm -hmm. silenced you from deciding now that you made the wrong decision about that one thing, I just don't think that they would, I don't think that they would take action and I just I don't agree. think they'd win. But keep in mind, I was the first person to take the house down. Well, and also so, you'd get criticized because you took money. Well, and... Yeah, but but here's the whole problem with that. The way that gets publicized is... Why? How does it get publicized? It gets publicized that, um, and this is how we think culturally, that people who sign settlement agreements get money for their silence. No. You want to know what people are getting money for? They never freaking work again. That's be true, too. Because they get blackballed from the industry. That's true, too. They're considered to be a troublemaker. And that's what I'm also trying to change. Not just laws, but... And by the way, passing bipartisan legislation in the most hyper-political time of our generation is easier than changing culture. And that's saying a lot. No, I'm just saying it's hard to, because I've watched other people in this sphere. I'm not suing anyone and I'm not asking for any anything. So it's very powerful because you can't say that I'm just going for money. Now, I'm not saying that's what you did. You experienced torture. And also, someone should be, whatever. Yes, it's that you can't work again. But... Um, it's okay to say I want compensation for what I experienced or that there were yeah. damages or it's damages. Cause but you that's can't an old school way of solving these things. So what I'm trying to do through lift our voices now is, is change the way companies think about these things. They spend millions of dollars trying to cover things up. Oh, I know. You know, imagine if they actually put all those resources into, into independent investigations that don't penalize the person who had the courage to come forward. How this should work is, like, let's say I come forward, I say, this is how I'm being treated at Fox News. They do an independent investigation, not the kind. No, where, I know the bullshit, the, the bullshit investigation. HR yeah, or hiring a law firm for a million bucks that I they've agree. worked with for 20 years. I agree. None of that. Bullshit. Independent. Use the money that they're using to cover up shit. Do an independent investigation. Find out Gretchen's telling the truth. She gets to keep her job. Why? Why should people who have courage to come forward be the ones that get shunted out never work again. And by the way, because it's all secret, the perpetrator gets to keep their job because nobody knows what's happening. And this is how this vicious cycle yes, has gone I, on I, and I agree. On I'm actually on. not on, I, it's actually not that dissimilar what I'm talking about. So the reality reckoning, I'm not sure what you understand about it. But totally. I've read all, I know everything you're doing. But what happens, I just said something. I literally wasn't even about me per se. It was just like, wait a second, this is the most exploited group because these are people that are being themselves um, quote unquote, playing themselves. 
and they lose jobs and kids are damaged forever and have mics on them. And what's different though is that you could define that it was improper uh, improper practices in the workplace. The reason that this is more cave era and more archaic is this is not a workplace. So you have to be there on time. You are not allowed to not show up. You have rules, you have contracts, you have regulations, but they're entirely to benefit the realm. You are not an actual worker. So you don't you get paid by a third party so it doesn't seem like you're a real worker. Meaning you can you could drink 40 drinks at work here. You could be an addict that's recovering and start doing drugs and th- that will be celebrated in this workplace. You could you could tell call someone a whore or something racist and the only reason that those things sometimes don't make it to air are because the network will get criticized not because the person the person is not is not valued Mm -hmm. but the similarity is that the top is is literally monetizing and benefiting from this off of women's backs and it's an environment where it's literally celebrated and designed for women to trash other women Mm -hmm. to set to not explore people's lives but to exploit them oh you stole let you stole your son's gay and not out your you know you said something racist like we think you're a prostitution whore. We're going to make a song about it. We're going to do a game show about it. So like it's the upside down because we don't even have the baseline of it being a workplace to then say this is improper work in the workplace. Well, let me tell you the two laws I passed last year to get rid of NDAs for sexual misconduct and forced arbitration, which is the other way that you're silenced. You, it, people have no idea what that is, but it means that you can't go to court. You can't openly sue somebody. You have to go to this secret place yes, called exactly. arbitration. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay? Which is so my two laws I passed even protect reality show workers, okay? Even though because they're independent contractors, right? Yep. So I made sure to have that in the language of both of my bills because especially after COVID, there are so many gig workers, independent contractors, migrant workers. They're all covered on my so so your reality fight for you. It, there is a lot of synergy. Oh yeah. My laws actually protect reality show workers, even though they're not real employees. So if they faced sexual misconduct during their time while they're there, they don't have to be silenced anymore. The di- there's also, there's no one to go to. There is no hall monitor. There is no HR. There would be no one to talk to. You'd be talking to a producer who's paid to get you to drink. It doesn't mean they're pouring it down your throat. It means they're having alcohol everywhere and telling someone else, get her to play that drinking game. So, and there's no therapy and, I've seen people have nervous break. I've seen people have breakdowns and then be put on television days after. Like mm-hmm. it's actually abuse and it's emotional abuse. And so, and by the way, many people don't get compensated at all. Like, I know. And, and forever. Like you Until didn't get paid. Until they become well known and then they no, do. No, even if you are well known, then I got paid $7,250 for my first season and 15 years later I'm on the entire buses and those are still being aired and my picture is still on the thumbprint. And I don't see any of that. You don't get a residual from that. Zero. Oh, no, no one realizes that. That if it, and now they sell, they they've just sold it again. They keep selling and selling and selling. So Bravo sells it. We're gonna hack up the chicken and we're giving something to, to Hey You, Hey You Australia, Hey You UK, to Amazon, to this one, to that one, to Peacock. Not a thing. And the memes and the and the gifts. Like we are really in the dark ages because even and it's hard to say. Even some place like Fox or CBS or CNN or ABC, there is some like. There is some sort of governor. Like there is a, you sign a contract, you're supposed to be in a workplace. So you can say like, this is not okay. You might not be heard, but there, this is not even, this is literally the wild, wild west and no one's looked at it for 30 years. So. Oh, well, good for you for, for. So, but, but more, more importantly than the, the, the details about it is like, I know you felt this, what it feels like to say something first, to know that you're right. And a lot of people on the macro level to agree and know that you're right. But the peers and the people in the mid-level that are scaredy cats, they're the ones making you think that you might be fucked, <laughs> that you might be like, you know what I'm saying? Like I, my brain is upside down. I'll see people on the street and I'll hear from people that are running multi-billion dollar, you know, publicly traded companies in entertainment that are saying, I want to hear what you're doing. I want to be part of it. Sag and after coming to me, I want to be part of it. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows I'm right. But at my peer level and the mid-level, I'm toxic and people won't work for me and some producers won't work with me. I don't care because I also think that I started this at a later period in my career and life than you did. You were younger and like you said, like earning power was cut off earlier. Like I'm, I'm 
I want to be in my pajamas doing makeup and cottage cheese videos. You know what I mean? So like I'm not, but I definitely have risked a lot and, and like been on the verge of cancellation for this thing that I'm not even making money for. But I have all these people behind me that are now depending upon me and I can't open, you can't open your mouth, which is what all celebrities do and not back it up. Right. You got to go the way. The no, distance. Our, look, your path is very similar to what I did. You're helping people you'll never meet. Right. Right. I say this all the time. This will be my legacy. What I'm doing now, I'm helping millions of people who I will never, ever meet in this world because we have gazillions of workers in America. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the work I'm doing at Lift Our Voices to get rid of the way we silence these stories. I have a lot of people who disagree with me, too, mainly companies, mm-hmm. because they don't want to deal they, with it. They like their dirty laundry right. being silenced. Right? right. But the people I'm helping, it's massive. Oh, yeah. It's, it's basically everyone from from minimum wage workers up to white collar jobs because we're all subjected to these silencing mechanisms but we have no idea what we're signing when we start a job that's you're the also helping people that disagree with you and too were too scared to stick up for it 100%. and they knew that you and they knew that you were right mm-hmm. and you had people secretly texting you telling you that they don't have the courage that you do but you're right and they're cheering you on you were having silent cheers right yes 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 i mean i didn't hear from a tremendous amount of people at fox news but the rest of the world, yes. Well, I mean, what about was, the rest of the entertainment industry yeah, too? Yeah, yeah, oh, compl- Look, this was this is rampant in as we saw because then the Harvey Weinstein allegations came out 15 months after my stories. But the only reason those came out is because the reporters at the New York Times were given the green light to actually look into them more seriously because my case had come forward. And you right? don't get the credit for that. No, no, I don't. You but, don't. Um, but I know what happened exactly. And. Uh, I know they always they always say that the Me Too movement started in October of whatever year that was, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, because I came forward in July, 15 months before that. Which, you know, look, there's so many of us who played a part in this, but definitely it took an immense courage from me to be by myself, and and jump off the cliff. Well, that's why I'm. That's why it's funny because you deserve the credit and you want it because you know how you felt naked, alone, and afraid. Like I have been standing naked being like what am I doing why am I doing this what am I your head's blowing up you don't know what you're doing and yeah you want the credit because it wasn't easy when you first opened your mouth you were shitting your pants right but you open your mouth and then once the words came out you're like all right I guess we're going yeah and there was no safety net below except for all the survivors who started reaching out to me and they actually were what buoyed me in my darkest days I realized there were two epidemics there was an epidemic of misconduct in the workplace right but there was also an epidemic of putting it under the carpet and silencing it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I rolled up my sleeves and back to how we started with my hard work ethic that I've had my whole life. I was like, I got to do something about this. Like I have to, I have to pay tribute to all these people who came before me who nobody has ever heard of because they were silenced. Yeah. Well, you're saying there's two problems. One, the actual issue Two, the cover your ass. Exactly. Cover your ass is massive. I'm dealing with cover your ass. And once the thing I will say to people who want to fight for something and who could possibly have the courage that is kind of what you're saying Once the match gets lit, it's a forest fire. They cannot stop it. Like that's, I'm already there. Like where I'm telling people, don't worry, we got this. And I'm not even sure how I just am positive. Not even like blind faith. Like it's too powerful. It's too true. And you don't even have to get politicians to agree with you, which I do. Yeah. Passing laws. Like, oh my God. So I've walked the halls of Congress for the last, you know, six, six and a half years. Um, and, And to your point about knowing that you're doing the right thing, but having no idea when you actually start it. Mm -hmm. So for me last year, being at the White House and standing up on a stage with the vice president and president of the United States. Yes. And, and, and introducing them and, and being the voice for all of the survivors all across America and, and standing there and watch him sign this first bill into law and handing me the pen. Wow. That, that is the justification for me jumping off of that cliff without knowing what the hell was going to happen to me. Not, not because of Gretchen Carlson, because on that day we gave power back to millions of people who have been subjected to these kinds of things at work. And then eight months later, we did it again with our NDA bill. We, these are the two biggest labor law changes in the last 100 years. This is Labor huge. law is a very big issue right now. I was talking to Juju about this. They're very interested in this over there. You should talk to them. But you're right. The first validation was getting your personal apology. Now the validation is passing laws. And no, the lawyers that are helping all these people, they want me to go to Washington. Yeah, you should. Because, you know, of a union and unfair. This, you know, SAG after is very into it. I think it's, that's why I wanted to to talk. Sometimes I'll talk to someone and say that I should 
have them on, but like then it has to really pop off why. Otherwise, we're just talking about fluff. Like I was recently like, I've got to talk to you because we do have similarities. Um, and this is so interesting. And you really did break through. And I think that that um, what did you think of the documentary? Which one? Why? What? The, what's the one that I saw on uh, the documentary about you and Roger Ailes? Um, wasn't oh, it? oh, the miniseries. There oh, was, was it. Not there a, was a oh. movie called Bombshell, and then there, I, there was a miniseries called The Loudest Voice. The Loudest Voice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you'll you'll be fascinated by this. Wait, what's your um? What's your philanthropy called? Lift our voices. Oh, so it's simple. It, it's similar. To, that's why I'm confused. Loudest yeah, voice yeah. and lift our voices. Okay. But but just to put in perspective for your listeners about how restrictive NDAs are. They, I've had people come up to me and be like, oh, I saw your miniseries and I saw your movie. And I'm like, actually, those are not my projects because I can't participate in anything based right. on my NDA. That's why I'm asking I, how you, what you thought, though. Well, I can't even tell you, uh, which is my point. Well, was it good? You can't say it was, ac- you can't say anything? You nope. can't say good or I bad? I can't say the portrayal was accurate. I can't, here's what I can say. And now my brain's again in overdrive. I can say that I think it's absolutely amazing and wonderful that actresses of the caliber of Naomi Watts and Nicole Kidman took on these roles playing Gretchen Carlson. Like, I'm just a small town kid who grew up in Minnesota. Right. Like, that's crazy, okay? The fact that they thought that this issue was important Great enough, point. Great point, right? The movie and the miniseries has probably helped countless numbers of people to also develop the same kind of courage. Mm-hmm. Worth it. Whether or not I can actually tell you that, you know, the portrayal of me is accurate or not kind of doesn't matter if those two things are more. Oh, and the third thing is Hollywood would have never made these projects seven years ago. Right. Right. I mean, so that's the third big thing. I mean, would I love to own my own truth? Like people are always alarmed when I give speeches or do interviews and I say, I don't own my own truth. I don't own my own story. How fucked up is that? Very fucked up. Yeah. But, yeah. But by but, the way, the, the, bigger, the bigger picture is people want, it happens in divorces with custody agreements or divorce agreements. You just sign because you said the deal fatigue, you're exhausted, you got something, somebody broke down, your lawyer says to you, just fucking sign it. Just sign it. And you don't, God doesn't give you everything, but really be careful in what you sign because I'm sure you have some regrets and because you just didn't know you'd be on this trajectory this no deep. I would never know and it was just commonplace but now it's not we've passed laws in states now where we can be more progressive than on Capitol Hill uh, in New Jersey California and Washington State and we've now introduced it in New York you can't use NDAs for anything anymore it's amazing so it's not an option if you live and work in those states and that is huge as we continue to move state to state to state because what's happening is companies that are based in those states now they're kind of in a pickle because if they have employees all over globally, but they can't enforce NDAs for people who live in those three states, but they can make sure people are under NDAs everywhere else. A lot of big companies have changed their policy to take out NDAs for everyone. Right. But I have, a, I, I don't know why I just have this feeling that you'll have a, you'll claw this back at some point. I just have this feeling. What do you mean? That you'll go, that there'll be some law that's passed that includes where you used to work Fox and that they'll, have to public if you it, it, they'll they would have to publicly say you can talk about your story because they don't represent that anymore or something. There's got to be a way that you will find you'll find I would find a way to tell my story. Well, because I would make the people fight for me to tell my story and the yes. people say like un- sh- unleash, show us the tapes. You well, know, I've I've said publicly that Fox has gone out and said that they've cleaned up their act. <clears throat> if right. that's the case, <laughs> right? Then let me out of my NDA. Right. But the re- you don't let me out, so maybe you haven't cleaned up the act. I'm, you know, the more progress we make, Bethany, with these laws, the more pressure there will be to eventually pass a law to make them give up all their past people that they've silenced to. And when you're talking about Fox, you're talking about Fox News. That's what you know. You Do you know what goes on with Fox Entertainment? I just did Snake Oil. I had a great experience. Like, do you know what goes I, on with Fox? I, I have no idea, but right. I, I do know that my NDA is with the parent company. Okay. And so they try and entangle you so that if even one of those entities decided to let you talk, you're still screwed because the other two. So my third, you're not going to oh. believe this. My, the third person or group in my NDA is Roger Ailes, who was my alleged predator, who died. Right. But even though he's a dead man. Is his wife. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So she would have to agree. How cr- 
crazy is that? Right. She'd have to agree to let me out, even though he's dead. That's that's how screwed up this country became with silencing its people. Yeah. And so, look, this movement this time isn't going away. So you're right. There is what we're hoping <laughs> for dur- with our work at Lift Our Voices is that, that, is that there will be this public outcry that people will say, we're not going to work at places that silence us anymore. Yeah. And in fact, this coming year, we're going to put out the first ever survey so that people will know companies that silence them and companies that don't. That'll be a huge resource for people to to understand because it's the number one question I get. But it's also going to be a subtle nudge to companies to change their policies because they're going to get a bad grade from me. Yeah. And I come I come as a credible source on this issue. So if I say this company silences their people and I'm giving them an F, that might spur them on to change their policies. And where like, are you saying all this? How do you? Wh- where we're is we're your... currently doing all the research right now. No, we're, I mean, what's your current vehicle for communication? You're not on. Te- are you on television regularly? Like, where are you saying all this? Where is this? Yeah, is that, you're I mean, here today talking about this, but where are people? Podcasts, te- TV conferences, um, social media. Um, you know, you and I can do something together, so you can help me get the word out. Yeah, and vice versa. But uh, but eventually, this is going to be released sometime next year. First of its kind. Nobody else is judging companies using my metrics of whether or not they silence you. And I believe it's the silver bullet to equity. Because so, it, what are some great companies? Um, they're very few and far between. Like, what are companies that have jumped off the page? You Airbnb back? is a great company. Yeah. Airbnb is donated, by the way, to Be Strong and helped people. So we've worked with them. So that's I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I mean, I can't vouch for what goes on inside of Airbnb. No, I know. But, You're saying from your perspective. What I'm saying from my perspective, they don't use forced arbitration and they don't use NDAs. Amazing. Um, and now, uh, now, of course, because of my laws, no company can use forced arbitration for sexual misconduct anymore. Right. But here's the problem, Bethany. They're not going to tell the employees that. They don't have to tell the employees. So so let's say you signed a contract 10 years ago and it has an NDA and a forced arbitration clause and you're being sexually harassed. You don't have to abide by the NDA or the forced arbitration anymore, but you may not know that. So me getting this word out is so important. I agree pe- because no, I'm thinking no about idea. what the lawyers have said is happening with with Bravo and I feel like the word arbitration has been oh, thrown yes. around. It's everywhere. And in, you feel in, like arbitration is a scam? No, here, okay, here's what I want to hear about Here's this. what it is. So arbitration was never intended to adjudicate human rights violations at work. It was it was like if, if I was your neighbor and you knocked over my fence with your car. Like the people's court. Exactly. A dispute. Instead of clogging the court system, yes. they came up with a process called arbitration for a $300 claim so that judges wouldn't be bogged down with all these ridiculous cases. Okay. Okay. That was the point of arbitration. Go to an arbiter, work out your claims, pay your 300 bucks, goodbye. Companies got smart about 40 years ago and decided to start putting forced arbitration clauses in people's contracts. So if anything bad happened, nothing would ever come out because arbitration is a secret process. Interesting. So you couldn't openly sue. So what's happened over time with NDAs and forced arbitration is that America thought we had come so far in discrimination and sexual harassment and all that because nobody was ever hearing about these cases. And so when I jumped off the cliff and then the, the mountain happened with all these people coming forward, the American public got pissed because they were like, wait a minute, I thought we had solved this. The reason that they didn't know about it was because it was all going to secrecy. All these cases, thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, were going to forced arbitration instead of an open court wow so these people and the, and the scariest part about it is only two percent of all arbitration cases are found for the complainant so why bother lawyers won't even take your case if you have a forced arbitration clause and because it's a secret process nobody knows that there's a predator who's going to arbitration and they get to keep working you're fired you never work again you don't get us you don't get any compensation because you only I'm win texting the lawyers uh, right it was, it's, I it's, ask so I can I'll help you with this it's crazy right. you got oh sorry will you tell um Mia to text Bryn. I want to uh, to call Bryn. She always calls me during the podcast. I just want to <laughs> see. Oh, is is arbitration? Hold on. Yeah, I'm sure it's there because in 1991, two percent of all employees had forced arbitration clauses. By next year, eighty. So would you call it bullshit? Yes, eighty-four percent. Because Gretchen percent. Carlson says it's bullshit, and she's doing. Because I I listen. Thank you. You're welcome. Says it's bullshit. 
Because it covers shit up. And covers shit up. Okay, yeah. I'm writing that to the lawyers. They don't, they can't. So the only reason you know about my story, Bethany, yes. is because my lawyer, I happen to be able to have the resources to have brilliant lawyers, which not everybody can. Okay. And they came up with a brilliant strategy to sue Roger Ailes personally to try to circumvent my forced arbitration clause that I had with the company. A strategy. It's the only way my case yeah. became public. Okay. And not everyone has that opportunity or option. We arguably would not be in the Me Too movement if they had not thought of that. Okay. So forced arbitration is, a, is an unbelievable evil. Next year, 84% of all Americans will be under it. 84% of us. That's an explosion from 1991 when only 2% of us was. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't understand that. What was that? Yeah. You said 84% will be what? You'll... 84% of all American workers will, will have signed a forced arbitration clause when they go to work or it's in their handbook or they... Because they don't think the worst they, is going to happen. So they, if they something fucked up is. happens to you, 84% of people are well, kind of silenced. silenced and have to secretly work this thing out. The, and, and then you're and not helping anyone and you're not paying it forward. And even if you get some money, it's 2% of you and you haven't even been able to be publicly vocal about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So the rest of the world thinks Listen that... Listen, everybody here in the room, yeah. look at your contracts. Exactly. Look at your contracts. And one third of all Americans sign NDAs on their first day of work. One third. They think they're signing only to protect trade secrets where they work. So that's like, no, that's what Bravo Bravo just said. The NDA is just to protect storylines. Okay, great. Like have who cares lawyer, who's have, have a Ramona lawyer look sleeping at that. with? <laughs> you know what I mean? But have a lawyer look at that because let me tell you something. These NDA clauses don't scream to you if something bad happens to you, you won't be able to talk about it. It just looks like you're never if you work at Coke, you're not gonna go across the street to Pepsi and give the recipe. For no, Coke, it's right? but by the way, it's no, it's what Bravo saying they're saying of course it was just to protect storyline back to the cover your ass model which who everything leaks in the media anyway no one cares who Ramona's sleeping with it's not a secret because someone's leaked it to the media so that's I bet, bullshit I bet the NDA is broader than that I bet it also means that anything bad that happens to anyone on set that they can't talk about it no you also it, can't sue other people that's right you can't sue other people that you work with no yeah. it's a shit show it and is, they, they, I am their worst nightmare well so am i <laughs> i am their worst possible nightmare because i have nothing to lose i did not sue them i'm not looking for money so they can't like shut me up mm -hmm. they can't shut me up what are they gonna do we'll give you money i don't need your fucking money right they can't go put a Rolls royce cullinan in the driveway i don't care i'll take it and still fuck you right now i'll be interested to see what they say back because I, i'm sure I'm there's a forced you. arbitration clause it's I'm just text been you. It's just, it's everywhere. Sometimes people click on emails, Beth Bethany, that they get from their company. Just from clicking on the email, they agree to forced arbitration. That's criminal. It's insane. Like they haven't even, they haven't, they don't even understand. Well, first of all, they didn't even get a chance to understand it because they just, who doesn't click on an email from work? The government should be giving you grants to like have a lot of people under you to do this. Like this should Thank be a you. real like. You know, not for profit business. Well, this is, so Lift Our Voices is not for profit, but we are always in major fundraising mode because we're the only organization doing this work in the world. Yeah. And yes, we're trying to raise money to build out our infrastructure. I always say that uh, I need to clone myself by like a thousand people uh, because I, I have the capacity to do so much work and I've been successful in it, but you need money to hire people. I should have you talk to these two lawyers and just ask like sign something sign an nda oh god to hear no to hear about what's going on and i want to hear what you would say to them like okay. let them because i've been we are const we are always strategizing like they include me as like one of the three people even though i'm not the one suing because um it's obviously this stuff is very strategic and it's a wild wild west and it's new and you have to explain a language to them that they wouldn't understand because they don't understand reality tv but you may understand labor law way more than they do. Yeah, like yeah. it's a good, so I might have you, I might ask them to talk to you okay. because I think you'd find it fascinating. Some of the stuff, there are things that have come up like Rico mm -hmm. because it's almost like a mafia from the time. I mean, there are a million things that come up. Like it's like a mafia. It's like a cult. Like it's crazy, but the, it, this has been cracked open and I'm sure, um, we won't do everything perfectly. There'll be some eggs broken to make an omelet. Like you, you didn't do it perfectly. You can't even tell your fucking story. So that's <laughs> not perfect, but you've made a lot of progress. Yeah, no, I've, take, I've taken advantage of every possible thing that I did get out of that settlement, yeah. which was my voice on these issues. You know, I can't give you the details of what he said to me and what he did to me. And uh, that doesn't really matter when I'm passing no. laws. And like, it's not just about you. That's what you're saying. It's, not, not, about it's not about you. It's not about me. what he said to you. That's gossip. You're talking about the whole systematic change. I want to make sure that Bryn 
and and my children are not silenced in the next generation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and we thought we had solved all this crap in our generation. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We were fooling the American public because it was all going to secrecy. Yes. So now I vow to the rest of the world that that we're solving it now for our kids mm -hmm. and. Um, and actually a lot of this starts with our young boys because we do a really good job of raising up our girls. That's not what this is about. Men rule the world still. Yes. And we need to get to those men to say at a young age, help us do this, mm -hmm. help lift us up, stop silencing people in the workplace, help women. And, and, and so women can get in a room and go rah, 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 and then go outside and feel empowered, but it doesn't matter really. Because at work, if we don't have men involved in this equation, we are not going to move the needle. Right. They have to help us. And one way they can help us is take away silencing mechanisms, also pay women fairly, and also promote them. Well, in some ways, too, you're not going to get them to necessarily care. You might get them to be proactive just to cover their ass, and that's fine, too. Meaning mm, I had someone, point. you know, they're not going to give a shit. If but they I have had, daughters, they might. Might. It's so abstract to them because they're so powerful they don't think their daughters are gonna have to deal with it you know what true, i'm saying true. so but i just ran into someone who i you know i could tell you confidentially not on this podcast that is probably the most powerful person in the entire entertainment industry and they came to me to say i want to hear about what you're doing probably partially because they're scared i don't really give a shit they were like i want you to talk to my top management which i did and you could tell that they were all also partially in cover their ass mode, pretending they've already been doing all these things, but the, their the wheels were turning. And I was like, no, 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 you're, you, you, you would be smart if you got on board because you have exposure and this train's going with or without you. That's the same phrase I use. Really? Oh my God, we have so many synergies. I always say to company CEOs, the train has left the station. So get on board with the work yeah, I'm get doing. get the fuck out of the way. Yeah, you're going to get right. hit. Or you're going to get hit. That's right. Yeah. Because there's no going backwards anymore. No, it's happening. And that's why you have this power because you just know because you lit the match. And I felt that. And sometimes I don't even know exactly what I'm working towards, but I know that I'm going in the right direction. Yep. So, wow. I know. Okay. So, all right. So tell me your, this is the last question, your uh, rose and thorn of your career. Well, the thorn is obviously my experience at Fox News. Uh, Therapy and, because of it? Like um, my therapy has been all of my work talking to all the other survivors and, and the work I do every day. I have to wake up optimistic every single day. But you're not like now currently traumatized from no, what happened? No, 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 no. Okay. No, because I'm so, you know, embedded in what I'm doing and that's my therapy is like I know I'm making the world better. No, and you also, and, once you get that validation and vindication, it does release something. It probably took a while to get it off of you, but. It did, but, I, but I'm going to tell you that my rose is also working at Fox News. Right. Because it gave me the opportunity to to transform my life into advocacy that I never, ever, ever thought I'd be doing. It's not like you, when you're a successful person like you and I have been, it's not like you aspire to put poster child for harassment in the workplace on your resume. No. But I've taken full advantage. And a friend said to me after I came forward seven years ago, she said, you know, something good is going to come from this. And at the time, I was like, you're full of shit. Nothing good is going to come of this. But you know what? She was right. So she was right, and also, I always say to people, you don't have to know where you're going. Just get on the road, get in the car, yep. plan out something, but it probably won't be what you planned. You'll hit a roadblock, you'll run out of gas. Just, like, get in the goddamn car. And always be forward moving. It doesn't mean, like, I'm waiting for life to happen to me. That's not what it means. It means, like, you worked your ass off at Miss America. You worked your ass off at the small market. You worked your ass off at Stanford. You were, you're a work-your-ass-off person, and that's really what I think is the key to anyone's success. Not social media, not a filter, not a cute little tagline, not a reality show. It's working your ass off. Yeah, but you have those same characteristics. Yes. I feel like we could finish each other's sentences. Yes, so we're like in okay. a relationship now. No, the, and I'm attracted, I was talking to Juju Chang from Nightline yesterday about this because I am very attracted and friendly with strong women, but interestingly, that really have a strong voice in media. Like, I'm, I love Hoda Kotb, I always have. I connect with her. I really have a good relationship with Kelly Ripa, with Katie Couric. I've, I connected to Gail King. Like, I was thinking that a lot of the women, not a lot, like 99.9% .9 of the women that I respect in this industry are in similar, have similar backgrounds to you. Mm -hmm. And it, there's got to be something to it. There has to be a parallel to that work ethic and what that takes. Oh, yeah, completely. In a let's man's add, world. Let's add Judge Judy to the, to yeah, the mix. Yeah, do you know her? Yeah. Oh, so you'll, okay. Yeah. So you, you can, because I'm going to have a power woman's dinner party here 
and invite a group and add, I would die. I would I'll plot if Judge <laughs> Judy comes over. Uh, my, I just, my, my I fian- just ran into her in uh, in our town. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, she's the most lovely person ever. And by the way, you quoted her earlier. Like she, I, she was, I quote her she all was the time a trailblazer for us. Right? Beyond. Yeah, beyond. So she would and be. And she's a tough bitch. She hit 100%. Yeah. So she would be a great addition to the party. I love that. Okay, amazing. That'd be even more interesting. All right, great. So we'll talk about that. Yay, give me a hug. That was amazing. I'm so glad.